Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week marks the fourth anniversary of the start of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, the meltdown at three nuclear reactors on the northeast coast of Japan, incalculable releases of radiation into the air, the land, and the Pacific Ocean, the increased radiation levels over the entire planet, and the lies and cover-ups by the Japanese government and the nuclear industry to hide their impact on the people and environment of Japan and the world. We commemorate this anniversary with another in our series, Voices from Japan, direct reports from Japanese activists, a scientist, politicians, and regular people who have stepped up to deal with the devastation. It includes an interview with Taro Fujigama, one of the stalwarts behind the No Nukes Occupied Tent in Tokyo, who is now charged with not only taking down the tent, but paying a punitive rent to the government for its three and a half years of existence. Plus, you will be hearing our regular features, numbnuts of the week, activist shoutouts, the daily show Make Me Your Nuclear Pundit outreach, and more nuclear information than Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe Baby wants any of you to know. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, March 10, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. So four years in, where are we with Fukushima Daiichi? The big question remains, where is the melted fuel? According to the American Association for the Advancement of Science's Science magazine, Fukushima Daiichi won't truly be safe until engineers can remove nuclear fuel, but first they have to find that fuel. Detectors won't be able to map fuel that may have flowed to the bottom of the containment vessel, and any melted fuel in the underground part of the reactor will go undetected. Even TEPCO admits that fuel rods melted fully out of their pressure vessel. According to scientists at Argonne National Laboratory, hot particles may be throughout the reactor building and water collection system and even released into surroundings. Identification of hot particles is going to be critical for safe decommissioning, as was stated with clarity at the Consortium for Japan Relief Symposium by Chim Palm, an artist collective, Media never reported that the whole process, melt down, melt through, and so-called melt out, happened was done within a few days after the earthquake. UCLA researchers confirmed that immediately after the initial release on March 12, the plume of radiation moved eastward, reaching the United States West Coast on March 15, and in early April the plume extended over the entire northern hemisphere. Volatile radionuclides, such as iodine-131, were transported away from the source, posing significant concern on the safety of the population and the environment worldwide. Radionuclide increases have been measured in fish from the Aleutian Islands to the Trans-Pacific Migratory Species found at Amchatka Island in Alaska. Cesium-134 was detected in California water samples gathered in August of 2014. And these statistics all came from a report that was done in collaboration with the International Atomic Energy Agency. Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, the operators of Fukushima Daiichi, have been caught in repeated lies about the nature and the levels of contamination, making everything it says suspect. Most recently, on February 26th, TEPCO admitted that rainwater contaminated with high-level radioactive materials leaked into the sea from the rooftop of the number 2 reactor building, even though TEPCO became aware more than a year ago that the concentration of radioactive materials in the water flowing was high and continued to conceal details, including the fact that the concentration became high whenever it rained. Despite that fact, TEPCO decided long ago there was no need to monitor rainwater for radioactive materials. 
So having had their latest concealment discovered and revealed by the international media, Japan's Nuclear Reform Monitoring Committee has gotten TEPCO to agree to a new disclosure policy on contamination data, meaning that they say they're going to disclose it all, which is something they were supposed to be doing all along. Ah, TEPCO. Fooled us once, shame on you. Fooled us 4,837,542 times? I don't think we're going to believe you. So what's a radioactively contaminated, ethically compromised country to do? Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out a week. Fukushima is looking to recruit someone willing to visit the prefecture and help publicize its tourist appeal on a blog or other social media platform. I couldn't make this up if I tried. The prefecture hopes to attract more tourists while working with the Fukushima Destination Campaign Tourism Promotion Initiative, which will be launched shortly with the East Japan Railway Company in April, the opposite of ecotourism. Now, only one person will be hired for the SMS text-based campaign, and the job will last for all of one week. Obviously, they haven't a clue as to how social media works. The successful candidate should visit several locations and is expected to work eight hours a day updating his or her blog or Facebook page at least once a day. Yeah, that ought to do the trick. The position pays 10,000 yen, or $82.50 an hour, and will cost you your genetic future. Of course, no medical coverage is included. Application should be filed by March 15th. And if you, any of you bloggers, social media people, any of you who respond to this and go after the job, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out a week. Here in the U.S., there is a breaking scandal over the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant as facility operator Pacific Gas and Electric secretly used wrong design data for key safety equipment for 30 years. Way to go, Nuclear Regulatory Commission! California Senator Barbara Boxer released the information that PG&E used incorrect earthquake and accident data when building crucial safety equipment for the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. Friends of the Earth said the revelation suggests that PG&E has acted with gross negligence and that the twin reactor plant on California's central coast should be immediately shut down pending a public investigation. Failure of seismic safety equipment in an earthquake could lead to a catastrophic release of radiation. But after PG&E notified the NRC in 2011 of its decades-long negligence, the NRC incredibly failed to cite PG&E for any infraction and instead worked together to secretly and illegally alter the facility's operating license. Friends of the Earth has a case pending in the U.S. Court of Appeals asking that the illegal license revision be thrown out. More nuke reactor news? Radioactive tritium was found in snow and ice outside of Hope Creek Nuclear Generating Station in New Jersey at levels 500 times higher than the federal water quality standards. Whee! According to David Lockbaum, a nuclear engineer and nuclear safety program director for the Union of Concerned Scientists, the unexplained finding was a high reading and cause for company and regulator concern. The Chutzpah Award of the week goes to Entergy, owner of the shuttered Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant, because they want an exemption to use money set aside in a special fund for decommissioning to pay for guarding spent nuclear fuel. The company also plans to use the fund for any legal expenses associated with fighting the state, because, as one of their spokesmodels said, by the state taking its actions and causing us to litigate, you know, to defend the litigation. That is a decommissioning expense, and the monies for decommissioning come out of the Nuclear Decommissioning Trust Fund. I don't think they're going to like that in Vermont. 
and our congratulations to the Navajo Nations that has blocked a backdoor deal passed last December by an unauthorized committee that would have allowed uranium mining to restart on its lands, despite lingering waste from past mining and a reservation-wide ban that's been in effect since 2005. We'll have this week's special interviews in just a moment, but first, nuclear radiation from Fukushima, left over from atmospheric bomb tests, leaking nuclear reactors, or many other sources, have invisibly impacted our food, water, air, and as a result, our health. To help us all learn the best possible ways to protect from radiation's assault upon our health, I worked with Kimberly Roberson, a veteran anti-nuclear activist and certified nutrition educator, to develop an audio program that explains the best protective practices we've been able to identify and verify. The resulting program is called RAPT, R-A-P-T, which stands for Radiation Awareness Protection Talk. We have a free report available to Nuclear Hot Seat listeners at raptawareness.com. When you sign up, you'll also receive regular email updates on health issues we discover, as well as products, services, and detoxification protocols that can help you protect yourselves and your loved ones as best as possibly can be done. To get your free report on health problems caused by radiation and what you can do about it, go to raptawareness.com. That's R-A-P-T awareness.com and sign up for the free report. Tomorrow, March 11, 2015, marks the fourth anniversary of the earthquake, tsunami, and start of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. This year, we again present another in the Nuclear Hot Seat series, Voices from Japan, interviews and statements by people living in Japan about the problems they face and the actions they are taking in the face of this ongoing nuclear disaster. We start with Midori Kiyuchi. She is a popular television and movie actress, well-known to Japanese audiences. Since the Fukushima Daiichi accident began, she has worked tirelessly as an anti-nuclear activist and has appeared as a speaker and MC at many rallies and symposia, featuring such luminaries as Nobel Prize winner, author Kenzaburo Oe. We heard from Kiyuchi-san in our 311 special last year, where she shared her personal journey from uninformed citizen to frontline anti-nuclear spokesperson, a journey not unlike my own. I was thrilled when she gave Nuclear Hot Seat its very own activist shout-out at one of the huge rallies in Tokyo last year and in a popular blog on the Internet. Over the past year, Kiyuchi has continued her busy anti-nuclear schedule, networking across cultures, leading rallies, and traveling abroad to meet with other Jews and in our movement. Note that this interview was recorded before last week's court decision ordering the no-nukes occupied tent to be taken down. So she refers to this decision as one that is pending. Hi, Midori Kiyuchi, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you, Libby. Kiyuchi-san, you have led many large anti-nuclear demonstrations and other gatherings. How has the movement developed over the last year? Well, after hosting many gatherings this past year, my feeling is that the situation is certainly not getting better. Of course, people tend to avert their eyes from upsetting memories and unpleasant things, so they would rather remain indifferent about the Fukushima Daiichi accident and the struggles of the people in Fukushima. I think that people would just like to forget about it, if at all possible. So, although there is a set number of people that are behind the No Restart movement, it doesn't seem like that number will increase any further. It may even be going down. I think this is a very serious problem. That is not good. From your vantage point as an organizer and spokesperson, were there any encouraging signs at the events you worked on? Well, it's like a giant wave that has crested, 
and we are on the downhill side. Even if we hold a demonstration, attendance is down. There are very few new faces. Also, people who are involved in the anti-nuclear movement are in their 40s, 50s and 60s. They are old. There aren't very many young people involved. And the chance that they will start becoming active seems slim. As someone involved in organizing, I think we need to take steps to address these issues. Do you have any ideas on how to increase participation among young people? I have lots of ideas. I'm always urging the organizers of events that I'm involved in to try new things. Their methods are so old-fashioned. What's more, many of them are not tech-savvy. They are not on Facebook and they don't use Twitter. Email is a hassle for them, so they would rather use the fax machine. That's the problem. People are divided between those who get their information from newspapers and TV and those who don't trust newspaper and television and turn to the Internet. I think the biggest challenge is how we get people who use the Internet to become more involved. But the organizers refuse to consider this point. We go around and around on this problem. I did have some small progress recently, though. I had been nagging them forever to incorporate English phrases into their signage. They didn't pay any attention to me. I wanted them to make a sign that says, Don't forget Fukushima in English. That way, people who only understand English could instantly understand what is going on. Even simple messages like that aren't included. The organizers just don't get how important this is. The organizers just don't get how important this is. But finally, the acquiesced. At the beginning of January, there was a press conference at the No Nukes Occupy tent in front of the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. I was the MC. Of course, there is no English there either. So, I decided by myself to have a sign made. It's in production right now. In a few days, there will finally be a big banner that says, Don't forget Fukushima in English. Come to think of it, the pictures I've seen of the no nukes tent only show signs in Japanese. For an English speaker, that's quite a jumble of characters. Yes, it is. The trouble with that is, even if there are photos taken at the event, people from around the world won't bother to look. Even on the nuclear hot seat website, I rarely see photos of gatherings in Japan. Maybe this is because there isn't any English. Even a little bit of English would help get the word out that these kind of events and actions are going on in Japan. We also lack people who can take the initiative and network internationally. This is slightly off topic, but a few weeks ago, When journalist Kenji Goto was kidnapped and murdered in Syria, the media did pick up on the I am Kenji, I am not Abe campaign. Yes, that's right. If the signs had said Abe wa hantai in kanji characters, the campaign would have been ignored. And the phrase I am not Abe is crystal clear to everyone here. Uh, by the way, recently... You emceed an event at the No Nukes Occupy Tent in front of the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry in Tokyo. How are things at the tent these days? The situation is grave. The government has been pursuing legal action against the tent because it is occupying public space. The court will hand down the decision soon. They may have to dismantle the tent. It's really the 11th hour for the tent. Also, the main organizers of the tent are in their 70s. They have really held out for a long time enduring cold nights. It would be wonderful if we could let these people take a symbolic role and have people in their 30s and 40s take over. But young people just don't seem to show up. That's really too bad. Let's change the subject a little. 
You have been a very public, outspoken opponent of nuclear power. Have you ever been pressured by organizations or individuals regarding your views? No, I haven't. I have been very careful not to express my views in major mass media forums. I don't talk about nuclear on mainstream TV or radio, or in major magazines or newspapers. I don't really have the opportunity to make comments in these forums. I'm an actress, so I appear in TV dramas and variety programs. But these aren't the types of places where I am asked to share my social and political viewpoints. Therefore, I haven't experienced any pressure. I share my views via web radio and magazines, and places like Facebook and Twitter. So, is it fair to say that your professional life as an actress and your views as a private citizen are separate? So, you haven't been pressured. You know. There are so many people that are really taken aback by the very subject of nuclear power. You remind them that there was an accident, and they respond as if it was something that happened in ancient history. People just don't even talk about the subject as they go about their everyday lives. I think this is one of the biggest problems. How can we reach people through this wall of complacency? In a similar vein. Do you feel like it is difficult to speak negatively about the Abe administration? Yes, very much so. For example, if one comments on TV about things like the recent hostage situation, it will be immediately adjusted, or even cut, or people will be pressured not to comment. The momentum behind this is intense. It sounds like a very severe situation. In these times, do you see anything that can give us hope? I think we need to consider separately people who get their information from newspapers, television, and magazines, and those who get their information elsewhere because they don't trust mainstream sources. The people who only believe mainstream sources are at the mercy of the government position. The Abe administration dictates their point of view. So they believe that his policies are correct. Internet-savvy people need to use their intelligence to try and find a way to understand and reach out to those that follow the mainstream media. It's crucial for us to use our brains and compassion to reach across that divide. One problem is that online and independent sources such as Nuclear Hot Seat depend on donations to survive. In Japan. We have good sources like IWJ, the Independent Web Journal, Days, Japan Magazine, Radio Form Internet Radio, and the online magazine Nine. All of these sources run on donations and barely make enough to keep their heads above water. I really hope that the people who are aware of what is going on will step up to the plate and strongly uphold their positions. So that sentiment against the likes of Abe and the Liberal Democratic Party does not continue to weaken. Do you have a message or any requests for our listeners? How can we help? I went to Palestine last November. What I saw there, in addition to the recent hostage crisis in Syria and the U.S. military base issue in Henoko, Okinawa, really made the growing income gap in the world tangible to me. The gap between five percent of the people's good fortune and the other ninety-five percent struggle is increasing everywhere. The rich are getting richer, and the other ninety-five percent are worse and worse off. How can we stop this? It seems like the ninety-five percent should be able to stand up and overcome the five percent. We need to work together and help each other. That's why. I'm talking to Nuclear Hot Seat in the U.S. now, and after this, I will be talking to an anti-nuclear group in London via Skype. I don't get anything for this, except the hope that someone might be inspired to act. Even though we are far apart geographically, we need to foster ties between our groups and slowly nurture our movement. 
That is where I see hope. Thank you. There is one more thing that I wish to add. At the end of March, Hiroaki Koide will be retiring from Kyoto University. He hasn't announced what his post-retirement plans are. After the Fukushima Daiichi accident, Koide-san's life became incredibly busy, and I am sure he is really exhausted. Nevertheless, I hope that he will continue to speak out. He is a really important asset to the global movement. He has a technical knowledge, and he is a man of character. I was really fortunate to have a chance to interview him on Radio Forum recently. On February 26, a transcript of our talk will be published by Iwanami Publishers. I hope you will have a chance to read it. We are looking forward to reading it when it comes out in English. Hi. That was actress, movie star, and anti-nuclear activist Midori Kiyuchi. In her interview, she talks about the no-nukes occupy tent in front of the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry in Tokyo. Over the past three and a half years, the tent has maintained a symbolic presence, shedding light on the Fukushima nuclear accident, fostering aid to the people of Fukushima, and supporting the greater anti-nuclear movement across Japan. Unfortunately, the Japanese government has been pursuing legal action against two of the tent's leaders, pushing for eviction from the street corner that has served as the movement's ground zero. On February 26th, the Tokyo District Court ordered the removal of the tents and ordered the two leaders to pay around 11 million yen, or $92,600, in land use fees. They also required them to pay around 21,000 yen per day, $177, for as long as they remain. Today, we feature a brief conversation with one of the defendants who is on the hook for a hefty real estate bill, Mr. Taro Fujigama. Fujigama-san, Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. The recent decision handed down by the Tokyo District Court sounds like a devastating turn for the fate of the no nukes tent. Can you tell us what was discussed at your meeting following the decision? Well, the decision was in lockstep with the central government and the ministry eviction demands that we immediately dismantle the tents and evacuate the property. Also, we were ordered to pay a total of about 28 million yen, which is more than $230,000. However, they also tacked on a declaration of provisional execution, meaning that we have to vacate the property even as we go through the appeal process. This is what I really can't forgive. The judiciary and the government, the power of the state, worked in tandem to hand down this decision. The judicial branch did not work independently. Now it's up to us to decide how we are going to fight this decision. Needless to say, we are going to appeal. We are also going to ask for a reprieve. We agreed that we will continue our fight. The mobilization of anti-nuclear movement may seem to be in a bit of a lull right now. But the truth is that there is an undercurrent of strong citizen sentiment against nuclear power that remains unchanged. The biggest key point is taking this overwhelming public opinion and molding it into concrete action and a political articulation. Our fight will take many forms. The tent has been our spiritual home, as well as our base for action. It is a physical symbol of our movement. This tent may be forcibly dismantled, but I predict that there will be a second, and then a third tent. Taro Fujigama Midori Kiyuchi also spoke about Hiroake Kuide 
and his pending retirement. Koide-san is currently assistant professor at the Kyoto University Research Reactor Institute. Marginalized in academia for over 40 years because of his criticism of nuclear power, Professor Koide has become a sought-after expert with rock star status and a huge following throughout Japan. Here is his interview from last year's Nuclear Hot Seat Voices from Japan series. I am Koide of Kyoto University Research Reactor Institute. I first stepped onto the nuclear stage as one who had hopes and dreams for nuclear energy. But I came to realize the serious dangers and environmental justice issues involved. For the past 44 years, I have continued to believe that nuclear power must be abolished. I had hoped that we could stop nuclear energy before there was a big accident. Unfortunately, my wish did not come true. And on March 11, 2011, the Fukushima Daiichi accident occurred. It has been three years since that day. It has been a very quick three years. Because of the radiation dispersed due to the accident, a large area of Japan, which is not a very big country to start with, has been contaminated. Even now, over 100,000 people who have their livelihood ripped away by the roots are left to drift aimlessly. They can't even begin to imagine how to carry on into the future. I think this is horrible, but it looks like the national government is simply going to abandon these people. Moreover, surrounding the 386 square mile evacuation zone, where these people lived, there is an additional 5,400 square mile area that is heavily contaminated. If Japan were a country under the rule of law, this would be a restricted access area where people should not be allowed to live due to radiation. The several million people who live there have been cast aside and told, if you want to leave, go ahead and do it on your own. The government feigns ignorance. These millions of people, including children and infants, go about their daily lives in this area, being exposed to radiation as if there is no problem at all. Why have three years passed with no relief measures? I think this is very bizarre. Additionally, there has been no resolution at the accident site itself. Prime Minister Abe has stated that the situation is under control. But from my vantage point, the accident is not under control at all. And there has been no resolution. Due to the earthquake and tsunami of March 11, 2011, the reactor cores of number one through three melted down, and we don't even know where they are. We can't even access those areas for inspection. The accident is still progressing after three years. They have been continuously cooling the reactors with water to prevent further meltdown. But the more they do that, the more contaminated water they now have to deal with. This cannot be prevented. My feelings about the dangers of nuclear power have been reinforced by the magnitude of the problems we now face. Even after three years, we can't do anything. The one bright spot is that more people in Japan than before have come to realize that the hopes we had for nuclear power were mistaken. But the number of people who have come to this realization hasn't increased that much. And the Abe government and Liberal Democratic Party have made things more difficult. Even so, we have the facts of the accident before us. And I hope this will give us motivation for a better future. The most important things we need to tackle are cleaning up the Fukushima Daiichi accident site and reducing children's exposure to radiation. Professor Hirowake Koide. A gentle reminder 
That nuclear hot seat is funded by your donations. If you wish to support programs such as this special on Fukushima and every week's programming on all things anti-nuclear, go to nuclearhotseat.com, scroll down on the home page, and click on the big red donate button. Thank you for any help you are able to provide. Many of the interviews we gathered for last year's Fukushima anniversary program still have a great amount of truth to share with us, so we are reprising the best of them. Kaori Suzuki lives in Iwake City, Fukushima Prefecture. Before March 11, 2011, she was a housewife. Since the accident began, Kaori Suzuki has been the director of the Tadachine Citizens Radiation Monitoring Center. Her goal is to ease the minds of the people who live in Fukushima by helping them reduce their exposure to radiation as much as possible. From the vantage point of our radiation measuring center, I would like to discuss the changes we have seen since 2011 in people's attitude and the situation. So what has changed? The accident has posed many adjustments in our lives. First, the very fact that we have to measure the radiation levels in food products is abnormal. We need to measure the radiation in the soil of our fields before we handle it, and that is also strange. We can't go in the ocean. We can't let our kids play in the parks. Anyway, our familiar Nurturing natural environment seems to have gone somewhere very, very far away, and that in itself is a huge change. I think this has caused a shift in people's feelings, too. We used to be able to get along in harmony, even with people that we might not always agree with. But because of this situation, we have to peer deep inside the hearts of people with whom we form relationships. And this has led to a divisive atmosphere. This is something that changed drastically right after the accident and hasn't improved in the three years since. I think even before the accident, there were adults that had the attitude that it's someone else's problem. That hasn't really changed. But what I worry about most since the accident is the children. I'm concerned about their physical and mental health in the next 30, 40, or 50 years that it is going to take to clean up the reactor site itself. That burden is going to be on our children's shoulders. It is really the adult's job to work quickly to find a resolution for this crisis and reduce our children's burden as much as possible. Unfortunately, there are many people that don't think it's their problem. I think that's why many things fail to get better. I am waiting for the day that adults all over the world come together and take responsibility to solve this problem. I'm not really very optimistic, though. I'm just a regular citizen. I didn't graduate from a fancy university or anything. The very fact that I am the director of the Radiation Monitoring Center is odd. It's not a position that someone like me would normally have. But these are not normal times. This is a battleground. And anything can happen during a war. A weak woman can handle a machine gun and shoot down a soldier. And a regular housewife like me, who is used to cooking three meals and taking a nap, is now measuring radiation. What is the thing that concerns you most now? I am most worried about the children. Not just my children, but all of the children. Society is really distorted right now. Rather than thinking about the children's health, we are thinking about jump-starting the economy. Kids' symptoms of early radiation exposure, such as nosebleeds, are being completely ignored. I'm worried about those health effects, but also the fact that they are growing up in a perverse society where adults do not place the needs of their children first. 
I worry about what kind of adults these kids will become in the future and the burdens that we are placing on them. Kaori Suzuki of the Tarachine Citizens Radiation Monitoring Center. Kaori Suzuki. We will have an updated interview with her in a future Voices from Japan. Seiichi Mizuno is a businessman and former member of the Japanese Diet Upper House. He was president of Cebu Department Stores and has served on the boards of many leading corporations. As someone who has had a top role in charting Japan's economic success, he has deep concerns about reliance on nuclear power in the wake of the Fukushima Daiichi accident. Three years has passed since the Fukushima Daiichi accident, and there has been very little progress in cleanup and recovery. In particular, the continuous production of 400 tons of contaminated water each day and the increasing incidence of leakage are worrisome. The biggest problem is the apparent melt-through of reactor cores 1 and 2, which is probably contaminating the groundwater. So not only do we have more and more contaminated water from cooling, we also have groundwater contamination. On top of that, we have to think about what we are going to do with all of this contaminated water. Last year in September, Japan was awarded the 2020 Olympics by the IOC. I have serious objections to the content of Prime Minister Abe's speech in front of the Olympic Committee. Abe said that he will guarantee safety, that the situation is under control, and that the contamination was confined to the one-tenth of a square mile area of the harbor. He even said that the water off of Fukushima is well within the safe drinking water guidelines of the World Health Organization at one five hundredth of the limit. He said that there is no threat to health now, or will there ever be. It is obvious that he is totally wrong. The idea that the contaminated water is somehow blocked in a harbor is especially absurd. It is not following a route through the harbor. It is leaking directly into the ocean. There is evidence of more than 40 known hotspot areas where extremely contaminated water is flowing directly into the ocean. Even though we still face huge problems with no prospect for a solution, Abe based his bid for the Olympics on the idea that the situation is under control. Furthermore, if there is another big earthquake, there is a risk that things will deteriorate even further. They are trying hard to remove the spent fuel from the cooling pool in Reactor 4, but there is no guarantee that this project will even be done in time. There is also the threat that the Hamaoka nuclear power plant south of Tokyo in Shizuoka prefecture will be the cause of another accident. It is known as the most dangerous in Japan because it is located in an area where the Nankai Trop mega earthquake is expected to occur. I cannot understand why the Abe government is trying to restart the Hamaoka plan in these terrible circumstances. This is not only Japan's problem. If another accident happens, it will affect America and all of the other nations in the world. Even now, contamination from Fukushima is being carried across the Pacific and has been detected at a high level on the west coast of the U.S. There is no doubt that the radiation is affecting fish that migrates these waters. In light of the fact that Fukushima is not anywhere near being under control, I cannot forgive Japan for saying it is safe and consenting to holding the Olympics. I hope that people all over the world will share my concern about the state of Japan's nuclear reactors and raise their voices together. Seiichi Mizuno Finally, Taro Yamamoto is an actor 
and serves as a member of the Japanese Diet Upper House. He sees the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident as an opportunity to abolish nuclear power and works to help prevent residents from suffering further radiation exposure. In the 2013 election, he ran on an anti-nuclear, anti-trans-Pacific trade agreement, anti-poverty platform, and received over 660,000 votes. I am Taro Yamamoto, a member of the Upper House of the Japanese Diet. Three years have passed since the natural disaster and nuclear meltdowns of March 11, 2011. How have Japanese people and the government changed since then? Well, the Japanese government and the Japanese politics have hardly changed at all. Actually, they've gotten more cunning about lying and covering things up. Regrettably, there is still huge political support behind the continued reliance on nuclear power in the Japanese diet. It's unfortunate, but despite growing public opinion against it, the powers that be in the parliament keep pushing nuclear energy. On one hand, it's really hard to reflect the public will during elections because the issues get obscured. There are so many issues aside from nuclear, such as the economy and the social welfare. All of these problems get jumbled together and things that can impact human life, like restarting nuclear reactors and exposure to radiation, get lost in the shuffle. I think this is true all over the world. Industry dominates politics. Globalization and multinationals control the political system of any given country. So it's only natural that we can't abolish nuclear energy. It's not just the utilities that are involved in nuclear. Electronics companies, Mitsubishi, Toshiba, and Hitachi. Insurance companies, mega banks, construction companies, steel makers, and so on. Causing those companies to suffer losses is not very appetizing for politicians. So we end up weighing life against money, politics, and the political parties. That's why idiotic ideas like restarting nuclear plants are being considered here in Japan. It really boils down to exposure to radiation. Why is nuclear dangerous? Because it exposes people to radiation when there is an accident. But here in Japan, you can talk about nuclear energy, but the subject of radiation is taboo. You almost never hear the subject discussed on TV or the mass media. In various places, the true situation about radiation exposure is being hidden. If Japanese people can't face up to this problem, then this country will be ruined. It will take the rest of the world down with it. What should we do? Japanese people and people all over the world need to recognize this problem. And each person needs to do what he or she can to spread the word. I think this opportunity for me to have an interview on nuclear hot seat is an example of what we can do. We have to come together in this struggle. I think it is wrong that people's lives are being sacrificed because of money and the company profits. It's like the Occupy Wall Street movement, but 1% is too much. It's more like 99.99% of the people are being sacrificed. Taro Yamamoto Nuclear Hot Seat has several more interviews with the people and activists of Japan that we will present in future episodes of the show. To make certain you have access to what these people have to say, you can subscribe to Nuclear Hot Seat on iTunes under podcasts. We have a YouTube channel, Nuclear Hot Seat Videos. You can check our website every week on nuclearhotseat.com, where you will also find our archives and can search out previous Voices from Japan shows. Or friend us on Facebook, where you will be alerted of each week's posting. For activist shout-outs this week, 
There are many actions we can all take to commemorate the start of the Fukushima nuclear disaster, no matter where we are. You are asked to participate in the global candle chain of remembrance to commemorate the triple disaster of March 11, 2011. Just light a candle, take a picture of it, and post it on the Facebook page, Global Candle Chain. Thanks to Natsu No Color for suggesting and implementing this simple, elegant, ceremonial gesture. People all over the United States and around the world are planning to unplug nuclear power from midnight on Tuesday, March 10, until midnight on Wednesday, March 11. This is a way of boycotting grid-supplied electricity as a protest against nuclear power. There are four levels of participation. Level 1, just turn off extra lights and minimize the use of electronics. Level 2 means turning off power to everything except essentials, such as refrigerators, freezers, or sump pumps. Level 3 is completely disconnecting from the grid and using backup power, while Level 4 means putting more power onto the grid than is used during the day by using solar or wind. This is the third year for Unplugged Nuclear Power, and it is sponsored by groups ranging from the U.S. Green Party to the Ohio Sierra Club. For more information, go to UnpluggedNuclearPower.com. With gratitude to Joe DeMere for coordinating this effort. And tomorrow, March 11, all over the world, letters of concern about Fukushima Daiichi will be delivered to Japanese consulates from Washington, D.C. to Honolulu. Check with the Facebook group, Fourth Anniversary of Fukushima Nuclear Disaster, to learn more about the events in your area. And our thanks to Nick Thabit for putting together this Facebook site. Whatever you do to commemorate this event, know that you are part of a global movement that refuses to forget. As for this week's John Stewart shout-out, John, I hope you've got a good Fukushima segment planned for your March 11 show. If not, you'll be hearing from me, because it won't be for lack of my trying to get you to do it. So heads up, I'll be watching. Here's today's final thought. Both Midori Kiyuchi and Taro Fuchigami are deeply concerned about the present trend of people not paying attention to the issue of nuclear power. It has been just four years since the Fukushima Daiichi accident began. Despite unabated radiation leakage from the devastated reactor site and repeated scandals on the part of TEPCO, the Japanese people appear to have lost interest in the nuclear issue, perhaps because they've been manipulated away from any awareness of the continuing dangers. People's strong sense of crisis certainly shored up the anti-nuclear movement in Japan. This undercurrent of public sentiment has been behind the protracted shutdown of all of Japan's commercial reactors, and that is what has allowed the no-nukes occupy tent to survive until now in the hostile environment in front of the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. But the public's interest in the nuclear issue is waning. Large anti-nuclear demonstrations peaked in July of 2012, when over 200,000 people were said to have gathered to oppose the restart of nuclear reactors. Unfortunately, attendance at rallies since then has declined. And according to TV and newspaper surveys, 70 to 80 percent of people admit that their concern about the Fukushima accident is fading. This situation is very fortunate for the Japanese government, which has been scheming to restart reactors and forcibly dismantle the no-nukes tent in Tokyo while promoting the 2020 Tokyo Olympics and disguising radioactive ash from the burning of Fukushima's decontamination debris as an ingredient in eco-cement. That's what they call it. And they're using it in government building projects, including some meant for use during the Olympics. Shinzo Abe's government has every reason to keep promoting this mass amnesia of the disaster. And activists say that day by day, government pressure has been increasing. They predict the coming year will be very challenging for anti-nuclear activism. 
So how can we turn this tide? How can we rekindle people's passion about the nuclear issue? These are surely the most important challenges facing the movement in Japan. Midori Kiyuchi and others have stressed the need for more interaction with activists on a global scale. So let's give it to them. If apathetic or amnesiac Japanese can see that people all over the world are concerned about the Fukushima issue, perhaps their interest will be rekindled. This would be what the Japanese call reverse importing. It's a term used for Japanese entertainers, authors, and artists who are initially ignored at home only to find fame in their home country after they have succeeded abroad. Thus, it is reverse importing. So by activists from around the world continuing to focus attention on Fukushima Daiichi, reminding people of the nuclear nightmare they have along their northeast coast, and standing in solidarity with them as we find ways to work with them. This would be a reverse import of a sense of crisis, and also a sense of hope that they will not be alone as they step forward. To listeners all over the world, on the fourth anniversary of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident, please take this opportunity to send encouragement to the anti-nuclear movement in Japan. Turn off the lights, light a candle, meditate, send a prayer or a donation, do something to help. After all, we're all in this world, on this planet, together. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, March 10, 2015. Voices from Japan was produced by Beverly Finlay Kaneko and U.G. Kaneko of Families for Safe Energy. They handled everything from the interviews on the ground in Japan to translations to coordinating with voiceover talent, which consisted of Alpha Takahashi, Hiro Matsunaga, Toshiji Takashima, Chihiro Kawamura, Yoshi Ando, and Yutaka Takeuchi. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from ENENews.com, GG Press, Science AAS, Wall Street Journal, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Argonne National Labs, MCM, Switzerland, Symposium sponsored by the Consortium for Japan Relief, Italian National Agency for New Technologies, UCLA School of Medicine, Oregon State University, Japan's National Institute of Radiological Science, Asahi Shimbun, NHK, Yoimori Shimbun, Japan Times, TEPCO, Fukushima Diary, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, U.S. Atomic Energy Agency, Friends of the Earth, New Journal, VTDigger.org, KARE11.com, Malibu Surfside News, Quartz, Malibu Times, The Oregonian, Marine Mammal Center, Indian Country Today, Media Network.com, ActivistPost.com, Hani.co.cr, The Soulless Zombies Who Write for World Nuclear News, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Heroes All, which you are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under podcasts or just check us out on the website NuclearHotSeat.com. Our YouTube channel carries the show at Nuclear Hot Seat Videos. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halebi and Hardest Street Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed. And for this episode, go at it, help yourself to it. If you provide attribution, that would be appreciated. This is Libby Halevi of Hardest Street Communications the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep.